two, one. Natalie McDonald, CEO of Sunrise Senior Living and Gracewell Healthcare. Welcome to the Get Home Show. Thank you very much for having me, Simon. Very welcome. Uh, quick shout out to uh, Sharon Benson, your uh, HRD, uh, for, uh, for introducing us. So a uh, quick thank you to Sharon, obviously, for connecting us and uh, making sure that this happened. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the question that everyone's going to be interested in hearing about is, uh, so tell me, wh what's your experience been like of COVID so far and what does the world look like from where you're, from where you're standing? Well, I guess there's my experience as, uh, as chief executive of the you know, the two uh, organisations that I'm um, leading and working with everybody within. And then there's my experience as a, as a UK citizen. And uh, I think um, uh, as a UK citizen, you know, it's been for us really good. We've had three uh, children who've been with us all the way through the pandemic. Um, they're in the early 20s and we didn't expect all to be together. Um, so it's been a lovely time as a family mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, really sort of precious time. They've got a bit frustrated. So they've been working for Sunrise, all three of my children, um, during the pandemic um, as housekeepers. Uh, so they, I can tell you, that they bring none of the housekeeping skills back home. Uh, <laughs> it's entirely restricted to, to Sunrise. So at a personal level, you know, for us, it's been a good experience. And as somebody who's worked for a long time and commuted for a long time, in many respects, you know, we've worked perhaps never harder than in years and years than I have over the past four or five months, as has you know, many people in the organization and in, the, and in your viewers' organizations. Uh, but not having to commute, not having to do that sort of lemming-like trail down the motorway or you know, on the underground in London um, is fantastic not to have to do uh, for a period of time. Though I think we're all looking forward to seeing colleagues again and interacting in, in different ways than, than via Zoom and, and Teams. At an organisational level, um, well, I'm incredibly proud of, of my team and the, everybody in the organisation. You know, uh, there is nothing like a crisis to sort things out in terms of, you know, singular focus uh, pulls everybody together. Um, people worked uh, really fast, um, huge amount of uncertainty, as there still is. Um, you know, we were having to make decisions well ahead of the government getting any, any guidance out. And I know other providers will be familiar and empathise with that. Um, but, you know, it was, it was good. We felt that we, we mobilised quickly. We made decisions quickly. We made some critical decisions very early, such as not to accept um, patients being transferred out of um, hospitals uh, into our homes unless they were our own residents coming back and then only with testing and then we would isolate them. Um, so we made some things, I think, that helped to uh, protect us early on. And we were fortunate that we have a wonderful procurement director, uh, and I will give him a, a shout out, Christine. And he and his small team did an amazing job in making sure that we were fully supplied with PPE all the way through and continue to be so. We never had any shortages of any, at any time. And bearing in mind how much publicity there was about the impact of PPE shortages on um, you know, team member safety, resident safety and so on. That was a huge advantage for us because it gave our people a lot of reassurance um, at a time when they felt they were putting themselves personally at risk when there was almost no, no testing going on. So, um, yes, yeah, so uh, it's, be, it's been okay. We, we, we unfortunately, we had one team member um, who passed away um, and uh, we were sorry to lose her, but everybody else was okay. Um, although some people were, as you'd expect, um, pretty ill. Uh, but people, everybody else has recovered. And we lost 73 residents. So out of over 3,000 residents, um, that's not uh, compared you know, to how it might have been. Uh, uh, that's, not, that's not too bad. Of course, our focus now is keeping our homes as they are now completely free of infection, keeping that at the same time as trying to start to restore normal life, you know, more visiting, uh, relaxing social distancing in certain w ways, um, making sure that appropriate visits by healthcare professionals or from other members of our team can take place, um, but at the same time being uber vigilant that we don't allow the infection uh, back in. I think one of the things I would say that if you were saying, well, what's your lessons learned? Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's you know, the same as in any big sort of situation where there's a lot going on and a lot of change is, it's that old adage of communication, communication, communication. Um, you know, we communicated, we had daily calls for three months. We had seven day a week calls with our general managers every day for at least the first two months. Um, 
I wrote to all our families um, of our residents and our residents every week for three months um, because there was so much in the media that was shocking and frightening. And, you know, when you can't visit your loved one, how do you know what's happening? So it, we had to spend a lot of time dispelling a lot of the media coverage because it did not reflect the reality in our, in, our, um, in our homes. And as is always the case, we could have communicated even more. I mean, I felt we were doing masses and we upped our communications uh, capability. We brought in people. Um, we did masses of it. And yet still, you know, you, you still have people who are not quite sure, uncertain, a bit scared to take accountability in a very uncertain time and people getting the wrong end of the stick sometimes. So I think that was, you know, it's a reaffirmation of something that we all know from other sorts of crises and big changes that we go through, that when it's all about the people, that means it's all about the communication with the people uh, in, all, in all directions. So that's my experience, both as a citizen and uh, as, a, as a leader of an organisation. Thank you for sharing that. And I mean, the, the one of the big points that you made right at the beginning of the uh, of the, um, uh, the the response to my question was the fact of how proud you are with, uh, of your team and what you've managed to uh, what you've managed to achieve. Obviously, that's been um, I guess kind of proven in the in, in in the numbers, if you like. Obviously, you can't you can't underplay the fact that we're uh, the seventy three people have of course lost their lives. But I think, as you say, in the in the uh, if you put that in the context of what's happened elsewhere um the, the, the unfortunately people have suffered far far more than that which is obviously uh, absolutely devastating to uh, to hear so it sounds like an awful lot of an awful lot of hard work and commitment has gone into uh, achieving what you have managed to to achieve and it sounds like things are going in a in a, in a good direction uh that that last point that you made around the communication side of things really really key um i know that communicating to your uh, the, 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 the residents, communi communicating to the family members, communicating to your team and then communicating to the wider communities that you serve uh, from with each one of your homes is obviously really, really important. I know that one of the initiatives that you've been up to has been focused around digital content and uh, around yeah. uh, TikTok video. So tell me, uh, give me a little bit of an insight into the campaign. So it was the Celebrate Care Homes campaign uh, via TikTok. Um, yeah, you're probably better, better place to explain it than I, but, uh, but yeah, give, give me a li little bit of an explanation on what the, what the thinking was and what the project was. Okay, so um, so during the pandemic, uh, you know, it became increasingly obvious that mu much or most of the coverage, you know, aside from, you know, celebrate our carers on the Thursday evening and so on, which obviously everybody in social care worked hard to get the same parity for our care teams and everybody who supports them as with NHS workers, everybody was in it together. Aside from that, much of the coverage was, was very, very negative. And we made a decision that what we were going to try and do was to focus on the positive um, through the pandemic. So we did a lot on social media about trying to show how normal life was still going on within our communities and homes, which was, some of it was fun. We had um, Joe Wicks with the Beaconsfield Massive, um, <laughs> as all our residents were doing Joe Wicks every day and he you know, reposted um, for us. And so we had lots of good stuff that really was trying to say, this is a terrible time that everybody's going through, but actually there's a lot of normal things going on and we're trying as much as we can to keep life as as positive as we can for our residents who are isolated for who knows how long and for our team members who are supporting them and we found that was really that worked for us and it built upon some work we've been doing on using video content testimonials um uh, social media uh websites and so on and then coming out of the path of the, the crisis um, we're obviously in a situation where we want to rebuild um, our homes and their capacity so um, like everybody, we've been closed to new residents coming in um, for from, from many weeks and we want to refill um, our capacity. And we're also aware that the legacy of the pandemic is that there's a, quite a lot of fear. There's been quite a lot of um, lack of uh, loss of trust and confidence in care homes because people are frightened that if they go in, they might get the virus, they might go in and then there's an outbreak and they have to isolate and not see their families. So we had all that. And then on the other hand, we also had the most amazing affirmation and, and um, advocacy right through the crisis um, from our team members, from residents and from, from their families. I mean, you know, the number of emails and letters and so on that I got and others got that moved one to tears about what people were saying. It was really, it was really important um, 
what people were writing. And we knew that people felt that, you know, we had done the best that we can in a very difficult situation. And so we felt that in order to, to mobilize confidence in the sector, which is where the Celebrate Care Homes come from, it's not just about us, it's about all, all care providers. You know, we want confidence in all of what we do. And then also to build upon that, that real strong camaraderie that we built between our, our residents, our team members and their families. We felt that we would, um, we would take to TikTok as a way of kind of galvanizing our campaign. And so we've done a whole series, we've done over 60 TikTok um, short videos um, involving our residents and our, um, our team members. We've had 41,000 views um, in seven days. <laughs> um, and thousands of likes, and uh, we've got uh, Sunrise of Bramall is up there in the rankings. Have a look at it. They use a horse in their video. Um, it's very, uh, very funny, and that's been really positive, really, in, in engaging everybody. And then on the back of that, what we're doing is we're using the voice of our residents, the voice of our team members, and the voice of their families to help us in our recruitment of team members and our recruitment of, of residents using their voices and short videos and so on that we were using and will be posting in various ways. Uh, I can talk all I like. I can talk about our infection prevention measures, our retesting programs, our cleaning and so on. But uh, we feel that people will listen to people like them and therefore listening to other residents, um, other families who've been in the same situation is, is probably going to be helpful. Um, and we do hope that other providers will, will come along with us because we want to have strong confidence right across the care home sector. Um, uh, you know, as we, as we come out of this, everybody's trying to rebuild um, and, uh, you know, to some extent, as I said, we're all in it together. I definitely agree with that, that, that last point. Um, it, and, and it's been really quite marvellous to see when there has been so much negative press, um, a mixture of some, some good, good press and some really sloppy, terrible journal journalism. It's almost just the volume of it that's almost been the challenge because the more you hear care homes, um, it's like that kind of reinforcement on a on a day by day basis, and it is often on a day by day basis that the the the, the, the people of the UK are, are hearing this this message, and it's you can understand why they're why they why they have their concerns. the The reality of the situation is is that care homes are really really good at infection control. If there was anywhere in anywhere in the country you'd want to be, actually, probably from a safety perspective, being in a care home is probably one of the best best places that you that, that you could be. Not to mention the fact that the the, the the environment, the the, the care, the uh, the activities, the whole lifestyle that's provided in uh, care homes up and down the down the country, but people don't see that. So I think the whole, in the same way that in normal circumstances people need to be engaging with their with their communities in a kind of in a in a real world kind of interactive way, I think this is where social media and video content and other types of content it's so important. We all as uh, as, as people we spend a lot of time on the on the internet on social media and all those types of things and that's where we're going to be able to understand appreciate and to start getting uh, a, a greater um a more realistic view of what what actually living in a care home is all about yeah i agree with that i mean i think that yes i think that that's right and we need to depict things as they are not you know you know, journalists are doing their jobs, they're telling their stories and, you know, happy families, you know, is, is a bit boring. Um, and there was definitely a story to tell early on about the, you know, the dearth of testing, the real, you know, we had PPE commandeered as well, like others did. Um, you know, we, you know, th there were things that needed to be drawn attention to, um, as well as, you know, how hard care workers right across the country were, were endeavouring to protect people in exactly the same way as people were in the, in the NHS. So all of that needed to be done. But of course, there's a downside to it. And so it is important um, to give insight into what life is really like. I think that there is learning coming out of this, though. I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't feel very comfortable that as a society, when we're in a pandemic like this, the message to our oldest citizens, who in many respects, you know, you may not, not only lived longest, but sort of given a lot and have got the shortest time left, in any case, um, that the message is that what we do is we lock the doors and we don't let them out and we don't let anybody in. And if we need to do that for four or five months, that's what we have to do. I mean, our average length of stay of tenure in Gracewell is 16 months. So some of our residents will have spent a quarter of their time with us. Yes, they can, you know, we bought iPads, we did drive-through visits, we did 
garden visits. We did this, we did all the stuff that others also have been doing, trying to think about clever ways to keep people connected. And we've done all of that. But it's not the same as being able to see your, your grandchildren or great grandchildren. And, and I think that, you know, we've got, we've got residents who are really autonomous and self-determining. And, you know, they, they, don't, they don't really want to be treated like children <laughs> and told that they can't do this and can't do that. Now, the answer is not easy. Of course it isn't. Um, and, um, and those residents also needed to be with us because, because they, they, weren't, they aren't able to live um, independently because of either their physical or cognitive or, or, or combination of needs. Um, but I do think that there's some learning coming out of this around things like how we design care homes in the future in order to allow movement and socialization in ways that are even better than you know the obvious things such as single ensuite rooms and the way flow works through the home so there's lots of things um to learn from it um but um yeah i think it's i feel like everybody does who who works in the care sector you know if you, you feel a bit bashed for no good reason when people have been working their socks off to protect you know some of the uh, uh some of the people in society who are least able to to protect themselves it's almost like there's there's such a big dis disconnect between the, the the level of commitment the work volume the care the love the attention that's been 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 uh, at such a high level for such a long time now relevant to what the what the perception is it's just such a massive massive imbalance mm. um it, i guess that what what sits within that uh, around those challenges are what are the challenges that you've seen from uh, from the perspective of making sure that you're still delivering a, a great standard of of care throughout the throughout throughout the pandemic? What challenges have you experienced in the over the over the last few months? So there's obvious ones such as you know any multi-site um, uh, healthcare or care business. You know you you have a mixture of expertise and leadership at a local level, and then you have your systems and processes around your audit, your assurance, and so on in place and you have people going in as well supporting those those um, services and all of that of course had to have to stop but we found that um, actually we're, we're not going back to our previous model in terms of how we supported our, our homes we found that through um, really effective dialogue both using things like zoom or teams but also just the phone um, as well as how we capture and use data and information we were able to still have very good oversight of what was going on in each of our homes across the numerous dimensions that we need to measure and monitor, even though people weren't going in or out. So we're going to be saving quite a lot of mileage and quite a lot of um, traveling around the country um, coming out of this. And I think that our regional uh, people in all sorts of roles uh, will find that a much better quality of life for them, but there'll be no diminution um, of the level of support and oversight we're able to give it our, to our services. I mean, we, start off, we started off in quite a good position because we've got, you know, 95% of our graceful homes are good or outstanding and 92% of our sunrise. Um, so, you know, we, we have largely a strong, stable portfolio in, in terms of, um, you know, our compliance. Um, and we were able to carry on with much of most of what we were doing through the pandemic, you know, measuring all the things that we, we normally measure. And we saw some really interesting things such as, you know, falls declined very significantly because at times, you know, people were being, were being um, looked after in their rooms rather than wandering around so much. So, you know, you know bold gentlemen with Parker's disease who just want to keep going and, and then unfortunately fall, those sorts of things weren't, weren't, uh, weren't happening. So we saw improvements in some of our measures and metrics, um, as well as you know, challenges, obviously, on the, on the infection front. So we carried on, carried on doing that. But we, the key thing that we adopted right at the beginning, two really important things. One of them was we, we set up our, our, our COVID task force um, right at the beginning, and we centralized everything um, through that. So all communication to and from, we had standardized um, Templates, standardised communication. We had we'd done, I don't know, close to 100 different policies and protocols and different things. So we sort of tried to get into a rhythm where there was a constant. It was predictable, even though we were in a very moving situation about what was happening, when you'd receive information every day, with the daily calls, how information was going up and down, and that meant that even though people were intensely busy, we could still focus on the other things that we needed to be to be focusing on. 
And we accompanied that with a phrase which was um, three principles that had to guide everything that we did. Protect our residents, protect our team members, and that protects the business. And so all the times everything came back to, is, is this protecting the, those, those two groups of people or is it not? And if it isn't, don't do it. Or if you're not sure, ask. Um, and, we, and we sort of held, tried to hold true to you know, what we stand for, our, our, um, you know, our, our, our values, our, our proposition for both our team members and our customers is that in your work and in your life with us, you are able to achieve whatever you are able to achieve meaning and, and, and self-worth and, and, you know, have a purpose in your, in your life. And that remained the same. Um, so, uh, so we, so we try to, uh, carry on and we kept on talking about trying to keep things as normal as possible, even though they were unprecedentedly different. We are, we're advantaged. We've got some really good, um, uh, specialists, you know, in the organization, you know, we employ, um, nutritionists, we have occupational therapists, we have uh, Jackie Poole, our director of memory care. And so in areas like the ability to manage the isolation for residents who have um, dementia, where depression, uh, potential distress and so on, because they can't, they, clearly many of them can't understand what's going on, were really significant risks. And so you know, being able to use our experts um, virtually to be able to support um, particular sites and so on was, 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 was important. But underneath it all, all our, all our KPIs and our measures continue to be tracked and checked and so on as normal across all that we do so that we weren't losing ground uh, during the pandemic. Um, and then when the CQC put in place their emergency framework and they were doing the telephone calls and so on, you know, our people felt our general managers, our registered managers felt very confident that they were able to talk, um, you know, positively uh, about uh, how we'd managed the pandemic, they at site level and how we had helped to support them, but also how their home had kept on focusing on what was important in terms of all other aspects of the services we're providing our residents um, at, the, at the same time. Mm. Tell me about your, your, your view around the kind of the wider challenges within, within health and social care and the excuse me, in the health and social care sectors? Um, well, wow. <laughs> what, an enormous, what an enormous question. Um, I mean, I've worked in healthcare and social care for my whole career. I started off as, a, as, a, as a, a wee junior doctor in Glasgow in the 80s and worked in the NHS for nine years and then moved into healthcare management and then laterally into social care. So I've seen the NHS and social care from lots of different roles over many, many years. Um, and of course, the biggest sadness is the is the lack of joined up thinking and working between the two sectors. Um, when you look at the now more than ever, the huge demands um, on NHS services, both primary and secondary care and the opportunity for the social care system, whether it's within the community and primary care community and within care homes and other settings to work with the NHS. Um, to be able to balance demand, to ensure people are uh, diagnosed and looked after where, they, where, where it's best for them and best for the overall system. I mean, we, we, could, we could not only save millions and millions and millions of pounds, we could give people much, much better healthcare experiences. I mean, my, you know, I lament, you know, I look at the data, you know, the hundreds of residents who end up in A&E um, being checked out or admitted for all sorts of stuff and they, a lot of them shouldn't need to go you know we see opportunities through virtual triage and diagnosis now that we must capitalize on to, pr to prevent very old people ending up in hospitals in the middle of the night with all the distress that causes and then coming back to their their home their, the, the care home a few days later you know mu much older much frailer um, than they, they were when they went in. So I think that there's a there's real operational opportunities to improve how it is that health and social care work together. And you know, people are, have high hopes of you know primary care networks, STPs, integrated care systems, and so on. And it's really important that they truly encompass health and social care in the localities in which they're going to be operating and, and all the service provision. So I, I think there's real opportunities there. Um, there's clearly also the, um, you know, the, the, the need to look at the whole funding um, system and you know, I'm not going to be able to add anything more to what others have said 
um, about that, you know, for a long period of time. Um, you, we, we have a responsibility to the oldest in, in our society and the system is, is just not fit for purpose. And uh, if we don't act soon, the, um, the, what is it they call it, the silver tsunami um, is really going to, be, is going to be with us. That'll be like a different, not a pandemic, but a tsunami. And we won't be ready. And, uh, you know, we, uh, you judge a society by how well it takes care of its most vulnerable, you know, children, those who are unwell, and the, and the very elderly. So like others, you know, I think we need, we need a financial um, uh, and structural reform uh, to enable a more equitable system um, that, is, that is fair to the older uh, people in our, in our society. So I, I think we need all that. Um, I think the, my other obs my final observation would be, I think there's clearly things that we've seen through the pandemic where, um, as well as these kind of large scale things, um, I mean, um, I know, and it's easy with hindsight, but you know, it, the, the panoply of, of NHS healthcare and social care bodies, you know, it's you know, overlapping and so on. You know, the sense that you can run something as large as our health and social care from the sensor. It's just, you know, you can't do it. You, know, you can't run a care home, a care home um, business out of an office. You, it's about the centre, the middle and the, and the front. And all of them have to work um, together. So putting decision making where it should be made uh, um, and making it easier for people to make decisions and to move things at, at local level, I think is, is really important. Otherwise, people feel very disempowered and disabled and, and, and frustrated, um, even though everybody within that system Everybody at the centre, everybody in the middle of it was were working. I'm sure, you know, their socks off. It it didn't always work in terms of the impact on the people who were supposed to be the, the you know the ob objects of the or the beneficiaries of all of all of that thinking work. So I think there needs to be, um, you know, we'll look at that as well. From a health and social care reform perspective it the, the thing that keeps on going through my mind is if not now when what what needs to what needs to happen for for, for change to uh, to occur which i guess leads us down uh, a a road of looking at the uh, the decisions that have been made at a ministerial level so tell me about your uh, the i guess your experience or your view on the the decisions that have been made both good, good and bad from a, from a political standpoint well, good, good, bad, and indifferent. I mean, I'm, I'm, um, you know, I've, it's an immensely hard job to be in a position of real power and authority going through what we've been through. Clearly, there was a lack of good international col collaboration early enough in order to make sure that the learning in one country was really spread to others. Uh, and with hindsight, we can all look back and say, well, we, probably, we should have done more testing earlier and we should have locked down earlier and uh, all, all, all that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll know, we'll be better next time. We'll be better, we'll be better prepared. I'm really not sure that, you know, we need to, we need to look in a structured way and some of it is already happening with some of the select committees about, about what we can learn and how that informs decision-making uh, moving forward, you know, cause this is an ongoing, ongoing situation. Um, uh, and we need to do that. And there needs to be thoughtful review at a, at a later point about all the other things that we're learning, because this is not going to be the last, the last pandemic. Um, but I guess, you know, there is a difference between science and politics and they're not the same thing. Um, my view is very much is that um, I can only control the things that are within my ambit. And whilst I, you know, watched and, Got frustrated at times with contradictory or ever-changing advice and um, you know big announcements um, um, you know sort of grandstanding but then you know the substance not being there and people who were you know announcements or people finding out on the announcement that they were supposed to be doing things that they, that they didn't know not necessarily in our business but in other parts of the of the, of the, the services in the system I mean clearly that's not the that's not a good way of, of going about things but my focus really has to be on, on leading and managing the the, um, the teams and the and the services that I can control, and um, and can influence, and making sure that we do the very best that we can, um, and and that's what we've that's what we've done, and that's what we will we will uh, we will continue to do. 
um, the, the the financial structural reform of the social care system is not something that's within my my gift to deliver. But it, I agree with everybody else that it absolutely needs to happen. And let's just hope hope that as things um, move on, all those pronouncements are not forgotten, and we have something more substantial soon. And poor Andrew Dillnot, <laughs> his recommendations or something like them is probably what's going to is going to be put in place. Sure, there have definitely been some bold claims around what the, the government are due to do uh, with uh, with the uh, with the social care world. Let's let's see how those things pan out. I've um, uh, to to date, I don't think um, I've seen anything that, that's made me feel wonderful about the uh, the set of circumstances. But then again, previously we haven't been in a in a global pandemic. So again, hopefully this is the uh, the the thing that will drive those drive those changes. I'd be interested to hear, I know, I know you uh, kind of alluded to the fact that maybe it's not your job specifically to, uh, to or at least uh, kind of maybe above your pay grade to talk about kind of the, the, how, the, how the, uh, the, the, the minister should be dealing with the situation. But if you did have the ear of the, the PM, if, uh, if you were kind of a health and social care advisor, if you like, what would be the lessons learned that you'd like to be able to share with him to, 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 to make sure that he was in a position to make really good decisions moving forwards? I think the thing is that um, it, it's bringing together, you know, it's about strategy and, and action. You know, you can have the best strategy and plans in the world, but you can't operationalize them. They're not much good. Um, similarly, you can run around in a very disconnected way, think being very busy, but if you don't actually have a strategy, then you're equally not going to be very successful. And I mean, I think clearly there was there was there were strong efforts made in order to make sure that the scientific community and the epidemiological community were were, were involved in working closely with government and uh, and so on on this. But I think that you have to involve the operators um, in in this. You have to involve those who are close to where the services are delivered, and the people who are delivering them, and bring together you know, the, the, um, the potential policies and things that you can do with those who are then required to um, make them happen so that you come out with um, uh, policies and protocols that can be implemented that meet their intent and have real practical applicability. Now, clearly, you can't involve everybody, but you can involve, you can involve sufficient samples of people who give a very good feel and insight for what it's actually like um, out there, um, as it were, in our sector, people are actually, you know, working with, um, uh, you know, care teams and, and residents and their families and so on. So that the insights from that are brought into the decision making forums so that decisions can be, be best informed and therefore, um, uh, you know, most value, most, most value adding. And I, I still think that's an issue. You know, there's new pronouncements, you know, all the time. Um, like you know weekly testing and so on when there aren't enough test kits and the randox test kits have been withdrawn and so on it's just not it's just not possible um, to do that and it causes such a degree of um, you know wasted time as everybody runs around working out what they should do and what they could do whether they have to do things and so on and these things are avoidable with more forethought and and more it's that kind of more haste less speed sort of thing mm. um, that uh, when you, you yes you're in a crisis but it doesn't mean that you you don't have time to to think about making wise wise decisions talking of talking of wise decisions um what have you done to make sure that your residents don't feel isolated during the uh, during the outbreak obviously people um uh, the loneliness and isolation is a uh, one of the key factors within within all of that how have you made sure that um uh, that the, the residents still feel engaged with uh, the, the, what's going on around them and their, and their families, etc. Well, um, we did, uh, I, I'm sure what, what others have done, that we, we looked at how people communicate with their families and vice versa. And so we bought, um, I don't think, no, as soon as we were shut down, we bought you know, hundreds of iPads and people have been using, using those as well as telephones, visiting windows. We, we brought in these drive-by visits where um, you could see your, I mean, it, 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 I mean, it was, it's, it's sad, isn't it? But it was the best that people could, ha could have for a period. Um, and then of course we used our people who, um, we brought together all our activities coordinators and those who are on a normal times basis are responsible for putting together um, the activities and the social programs and the engagement um, 
of all different sorts that we have in our communities and homes. And they, in tandem with all the rest of the care team, just did wonderful things, you know, um, uh, uh, entertaining people individually when they, they were isolated, um, having sing songs in the corridors where people would come out of, could come out of the room, sit at distance. Um, oh, and, it, you know, masses and masses of stuff. And a lot of it we shared on, on, on social media just constantly thinking about how is it that we can make life as normal for people even though it's it's um it's really uh, abnormal um it was much harder for residents who are who are living with um uh, with memory loss um and uh and it was very stressful for um team members because they they were trying to keep people safe trying to achieve social distancing and so on but you know some of the things, but like using music, understand you know back really simple things like going right back through people's care plans, remembering what they were like when they were young, speaking to their families at home and saying you know this is particularly challenging. Are there ways in which we can reach somebody and make them feel more comfortable, more at ease um, through music or activities and so on? So all all, all those um, sorts of, of things that we did. So really taking things that you would do in normal times, but having to repurpose them. Uh, and clearly what we didn't have was, um, you know, the big communal activities or trips out and, and so on. But, you know, we ended up, we had entertainers in the garden, you know, with such lovely weather, which was, which was fortunate, being able to entertain people who were, you know, on their balconies or, you know, whatever with, with appropriate um, social distancing. So a whole variety of, um, of different things like that. Great to, uh, great to, uh, great to hear. So, and I guess from a um, from a family member perspective as well. Obviously, the, the, you can understand why uh, the the family member of somebody living in a care home, especially with all of the, the the kind of the media portrayal of everything that's been been going on. Um, what what have you done, and what what have you been able to uh, do to, uh, I guess, put their minds at ease during what what has been uh, a, a very unsettling time for everyone? Yeah. So so our our families, like our residents have different approaches to risk so um, we have some family members um, who even now you know think the homes should should be still be fully closed and nobody should be going in and out so they've got very low they're very nervous they're very low tolerance risk and then you have we you know would like to be able to bring the whole the whole broods in and uh, and you know, are um, you know want to see you know they they they're tired of not being and they're they're prepared to take risks and so on. What we've got to do is balance those two ends of the spectrum. Um, so uh, we did uh, really practical things like um, talking to families, sharing photographs, sharing experiences, facilitating all these calls and contacts, making sure we're reaching out an awful lot to families to reassure them uh, about their their loved ones. So that was that was the first thing. The, um, the second thing was we had to, we had to um, reassure them that what they were seeing and hearing in the media did not reflect what was happening in our homes, which is where we got into this thing where I wrote to all our families um, every week, formally, we emailed out and so on, and, and then they, they would often come back and many of them would come back in touch. And people really valued that because it allowed us to contextualise well, this is, this is this over here, but let me tell you where we are. So, and then we complemented that with the communications that our general managers would do for their particular site on the back of mine. So we would have general, uh, general communication for me, but covering important areas, and then the specific site by site, and one would follow on the back of the other. Um, and and that, that was really important, I think, for people to know where they, where they, um, where they stood. Um, and then we have tried, um, you know, we started to, as the infections that we had and things stabilized, then we started to uh, reintroduce um, uh, visiting. We did do some, some things during the pandemic. I, mean, I, I, I didn't agree with this thing about people not being able to see their, their mum or their dad or their granny when, when they were dying. So we facilitated visits to terminal residents of, for whatever cause you know, all the way through using PPE and so on. And I know that um, we had um, feedback from families about how important that was to them. Um, uh, and so we, we did things like that. You know, we, 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 we tried to be, we tried to, I guess, put ourselves in the position of, of, our, of the families um, and make sure that we were, we were both having 
broad policies, but also we understood individual situations because all every family is unique. And then we started to reintroduce uh, very carefully site by site. We had a we have had a set of we had a decision criteria that was based upon you know freedom of infection, um, testing uh, for all uh, residents and team members, and because it was asymptomatic positive results are are you know are potentially people can be infectious. Uh, we also looked at our resourcing levels, you know, running, um, visiting based upon our appointments, screening people, uh, including temperatures, PPE, supervising visits, um, and that sort of stuff. It requires greater resource and at the same time as doing uh, testing on a regular basis. So we want to make sure that we've got sufficient resource to be able to do all that and um, run the, the all other aspects of the home uh, properly. And then also we, we built in reference to the um, level of infection in the surrounding community. So we, I don't know, we did about five or six weeks ago, you looked, got, got together all the R rates of all the localities around our homes and then tracked those um, on a weekly basis. And on that basis, we were able to progressively open up our homes. And in, and in a couple of places, obviously pause visiting, where we felt the R level was, was getting to a point where we, we weren't comfortable um, that, that the prevalence in the infection in the surrounding area was... Was, was too high for us and we and we would pause things for a while and um and in doing that you know we communicated all that to our families this is how we're going about it this is what it might mean that we might be open for visiting and then we might be closed for visiting um but that's the way that it has to be so really setting expectations explaining everything uh, being as open and transparent as we could be asking people for feedback um we asked families at times for what do you think about this um, and you know it's, it's helpful to get people's views about things that we that, that we that we should be doing. So asking for that feedback locally, and then asking asking it for it um, centrally by when we were writing out to to all our families and and friends. I guess that comes back to what you uh, one of the things that we started with around communication, communication, communication. Just double yeah. down on the communication and just make sure that people have got a really good understanding. Um, and I've, I've spoken to plenty of uh, operators during COVID and uh, kind of after COVID around if people feel left in the dark, it's very easy for them to think the worst. Unfortunately, maybe it's a natural propensity of humans to, uh, to, to, to do that. So just making sure that people do have a really good understanding of what's going on so that even if it's, it, it, it's always going to be a kind of a reasonably anxious set of circumstances, we're in a global pandemic, it's, it's going to cause a certain amount of stress. But at least if you've got a really good insight into what's going on, then you can, uh, you can be comfortable knowing that I'm, I'm being communicated to, I've got the whole picture. This is, this is, this is what's this is what's what so uh, that makes uh, makes a lot of sense so both sunrise and gracewell are, are are seen as being fantastic brands and they have a great reputation within the within the market the, the, there's clearly a lot of special stuff that goes into making those brands what they what they are what what would you say the the, the, the kind of usps are if you like for the for the group um well, it's, I mean, it's always, it's always, as always, it's always about the people. <laughs> you know, we're, um, uh, you know, the Sunrise uh, homes are, are beautiful. Um, you know, lots of people are, uh, are followed in the way. But I think when Sunrise, it was before I was in social, I think when Sunrise came into the UK at the, be at the beginning of this century, um, it did bring a new sort of philosophy in, in care home living, you know, very um, a homely, not institutional, um uh and and that was in some respects quite different from 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 many care homes um and grace wells are, are different they're much more modern uh, very light very eerie very positive places and they have that um you know household within an, an overall um community feel so it feels quite intimate and intrinsically friendly um so you know we have a, we have advantages by that but but really um you know care is all about people serving people and um you know i know when people come in and they're looking around and so on you know it's the building may be lovely but if they don't people don't get a good feel about the general manager and what they see and how positive people are and the quality of interactions and you know how uh, how welcoming it feels how engaged the residents are you know how um what what variety of things is going on then they you know they wouldn't they won't want to come and either come in themselves or or um, um, suggested it somewhere where their, their mum or dad or, or other relatives should come in. So our our focus is um, you know relentlessly on 
on our people and enabling them to deliver great work. And in order to be able to do that, um, we have to have a really high bar in our expectations about what's good enough um, for our residents. You know, it's 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It is extremely hard um, to deliver, um, uh, you know, a really high standard of care and everything that goes around it all the time. But that's, that's, our, um, that's our aspiration, that's our ambition to, to achieve that. Um, and so we have to, we have to recruit people who really want to be part of that, who have the mindset and attitude and ethos. We can, as is always said, you know, you can, you recruit for attitude, train for skills. You know, we can, we can train people in, in, in how to work in our organization, which will be similar to other care homes, but, but different in, 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 in other respects. But if somebody doesn't really, you know, want to work in, in that sort of environment who people who aren't you've got to be resilient you have to be very kind you have to you have to love being love being with with much older people and and so on uh, and working as a team and all those things so um you know real focus on how it is that we recruit well at all levels uh making sure that we enable people to join the organization well the quality of inductions enabling people to join well to feel to feel welcomed, all, all those sorts of th things, which sound really simple, but we all know, you know, the, the, um, the care sector can be challenged and people use agency labour and then the permanent hires are kind of thrown in and because uh, they need to be on the floors and uh, that just drives early turnover. So, um, you know, no, no magic in it. It's doing all these basic things really well and consistently, recruiting well, inducting people well, making them feel really loved and part of the organisation. Um, making sure they really understand what their work is and how they do it and how it's measured. Um, and so they've got certainty. And then, as is always the case, um, certainly at, 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 at site level, it's about the quality of the relationships between the individuals, their team and their managers. You know, I'm far away most of the time, especially at the moment. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we want to have visible senior leadership and make people feel part of, our, of the larger organisation but people mainly affiliate with those that are around them and the home that they're in. And so that's really got to work. And, uh, and that's, what we, that's what we aim for. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to constantly improve and evolve uh, what we do, um, you know, through our recruitment, um, through new ways of, of, especially coming up now with so many 16 to 24 year old people are going to be, be looking for work, ways in which they can come on board, learn with us, qualify with us, potentially move on to something else but have real you know career uh career uh progression something meaningful as opposed to uh just a job uh and you know we'll be investing more in that um as we as we move ahead those things are vital you also have to pay people well for the work that they do um and uh you know you can have all sorts of benefits but you have also have to look at the, the core uh, core pay and benefits as well and that has to be um, attractive and comparable um, with other forms of work. I mean, there are much easier ways to to earn a living than than working in care, um, and uh, and therefore we have to make sure that we give people the opportunity to do great work, but we also pay them um, well for the work that they, they that they do. We don't want to lose people because they can earn a, a you know fifty pence or a pound more um, down the road. That wouldn't be. You know, we, we want to we strive to to avoid that yeah i'm sure um it, you you've definitely shared some really uh, useful insights i guess to to round things off if there was if there was one or maybe a couple of things that you think that care home leaders or or kind of broadly social care leaders should be should be conscious of at the at the moment what would you say those things are well i think that we're not out of the woods yet um the you know, depending on who you listen to, whether it's it'll all be over by Christmas through to we're going to be living with COVID for years to come. Uh, nobody really knows exactly. Um, I think we're in a situation where we've come out of the what might be the first peak, but we've come out of the of the peak of the pandemic, and there's no longer that sort of singular focus on on crisis. And what that means, uh, but still things remain very uncertain. And so, there's a couple of things I observe. So the first thing is that people are really, really tired. Um, it's exhausting, you know, it's not, it's not just the um, people on the front, everybody's tired, you know, if you've been recruiting people and working seven days a week, bringing new people in, you're tired as well. 
and um, you know we've had all the fear about people not being able to have holidays and breaks and so on. So as we come out of that peak and the businesses, all our businesses start to return, we're still coping with the pandemic, but we're also starting to do some of the other stuff that was there in the background or needs to come back and so on. And we're doing it with people who are pretty tired. And so I think you need to think about things like how do you rotate people in and out of roles? Um, how do you how do you share the burden and the load so that um, people have respite both within the work so that they're not too pressurized, but also that holidays and breaks are really important. And we have a, a rule at the moment, you don't, you know, people don't get sent emails at all when they're on, on leave. So you get the people who are tempted to look at emails when they're away. <laughs> and it was a disaster if you're trying to trying to um, have a break. But of course, most people's holidays are undone by lunchtime on the first day back when they come back to a couple of crises and they look at their inbox um, ah. and uh, it's all kind of goes. So those really simple things that, you know, enabling people to cover breaks. Um, the other thing that I observe is that, um, you know, the, all the uncertainty, you know, in a crisis, you, there is a lot of, um, you, you become quite top down. You, you're making a lot of decisions and you're having to make them uh, sometimes with limited time and with imperfect information. And you end up getting quite a lot of upwards delegation um, which is the right thing to do in a crisis. Um, and I think one of the things that organisations are going to see and care is that we now have to move away from that and back into uh, making sure that people are enabled to take accountability, to make decisions. Uh, as I always say, you know, if you can make the decision, make the decision. If you're not sure, ask. Whatever you do, don't guess. <laughs> um, and, and so I think there's a kind of re-establishment of more normal ways of, of leading and managing um and and back down to because i'm a great believer you delegate decisions down down to the lowest the, you know the, the um you know as close to the front line um as you as you can for those decisions to be made as opposed to everything being made centrally but we've moved away from that um obviously during the the pandemic to, to um to quite an extent so i think there's going to have to be a readjustment around a bit about how the organizations work and then the last thing is um to make sure that we take advantage of all the learning that we've got from what has been something that nobody would have ever wanted to happen. But we're, we're, we're doing the whole thing a disservice if we don't then uh, take advantage of the ways in which it changes us. So we're looking a lot at the moment about how we're going to redesign our support office and our regional and whatever functioning. So we're not expecting everybody to come back to the office and for it to be like it was before. And uh, that, does, that means we should be equally productive and we should have happier people as a result. Um, we're looking at, you know, what's the feedback? So what's the feedback from all the different constituencies about how well people felt things work during the pandemic and coming out of it so that we'll be able to take rounded decisions about how work and so on and roles and so on should be should be reconfigured to be optimally effective. And, and specifically, we need to look at all the uh, rapid advances that have been made, you know, with GPs doing remote consultations, remote wardrobe. I doubt a GP... <laughs> A bit frivolous but I doubt we'll see many GPs back in care homes um, doing uh, routine visits um, for you know some time and, and, and nor should they need to we actually got I think um, better services actually during the pandemic for many of our GPs because it was really flexible we could do ward rounds and pick up with people as we as we went so there's all that um, tri triage um, so that people don't have to go to hospital um, you know, these are fantastic um, things that uh, should make it much better for our, our residents and our team members um, coming out of this. So I think it's beholden on those of us who are in leadership positions to make sure um, that we're really capturing that learning for our organisations and ensuring that we that we apply it as we as we move forward and sharing it, you know, across why your podcast is such a great thing. This is part of sharing experience, sharing, sharing good things, sharing less good things. And, and um, you know, hopefully by people, um, I mean, watching other people on your podcast, people watching me, there might be things that you know, we all pick up from each other that we, we all learn from and help the whole sector be, to become stronger as we, as we emerge from this uh, difficult few months. Well, I, uh, I, I certainly agree with the, uh, with the learning side of things. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see kind of what, what happens moving forward with people taking on board the, the learnings it has obviously been a difficult set of set of circumstances but um i had uh, uh, my friend ben allen from uh, from ump wellness use the um 
uh, they're saying something along the lines of uh, pr pressure creates diamonds. Uh, uh, so I think there's uh, there's a lot of uh, diamonds being created at the moment because this is just about the most pressure that we could uh, we could have on the on the social care world. So uh, and I kind of get the feeling as well that we could probably keep talking for a while. So maybe this is an opportunity to uh, to say we should uh, we should once we've had even more time to reflect on this maybe another couple of months down the line we'll create an, another podcast together and see see what's going on in the world then but for the for the time ble for the time being it's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the care home show thank you uh, thank you so much for your time thank you very much simon i really enjoyed it thanks great stuff